Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 195 of the NC DWI Guy podcast. On today's episode, we have special guest Jesse Fry on the show. Jesse and I officially met in person at the Freedom Fighter Summit. We had connected by a video chat, uh, talked several times in the about month leading up to the summit. Jesse was the final speaker that got slated in at the summit. And man, did he deliver a grand slam on day two of the summit, kicking it, kicking butt. I mean, really kicking butt. Uh, gave one of the most valuable talks of the summit uh, discussing how to create a good culture in your law office. Um, it was a really powerful talk, in my opinion, something that I took a lot of uh, points home and how we could improve our culture at the firm. Jesse is a uh, coach for lawyers. He's a, a lawyer coach with the law firm Mentor. He's been doing that for about three years. Um, he helps uh, lawyers in firms of all different si sizes, uh, law firm owners um, in all different practice areas, uh, push themselves to the limit um, and grow and achieve their goals. Um, more recently, he has opened up his own uh, legal uh, marketing company, um, Scale Legal. Uh, he really helps clients in developing and growing their law firms using innovative growth loops, which are specifically designed to help law firms create signature client experiences as law firms are growing and building their brand. If you are interested in anything legal marketing based, if you're interested in uh, artificial intelligence and how that is impacted, uh, has impacted the legal industry and is going to impact the legal industry, Jesse is somebody that you want to connect with. Reach out to him uh, on LinkedIn. It's also really cool uh, to, to connect with Jesse, in my opinion, because he lives here in Asheville. I think there's so many uh, law firm companies and coaches um, that kind of advertise all over the United States. And Jesse is a local. He's right here in Asheville. And so it was really cool meeting somebody that just wanted to talk all things business of law right here in my backyard. It was just kind of shocking that I had never heard of Jesse before. We uh, kind of by happenstance met just a month before the summit, but uh, delivered a knockout punch at the, at the summit. And I think our conversation today is really going to get your creative juices flowing. Well, Jesse, I am super pumped to have you on the on the call. We got to initially meet kind of in the weeks leading up to the Freedom Fighter Summit when you agreed to come and share your wisdom with the audience, which was just a blast. You knocked it out of the park at the at the summit. And we've had a couple of conversations since then. And it's been just a, a blast talking about the business of law with somebody that is in it every day. So I'm I'm pumped to have you on the phone call today. Yeah, well, again, thank you so much for the uh, Freedom Fighter Summit. It was so exciting to get in front of your audience and just, you know, talk about, I think at that time we were talking about, you know, leaders and leadership, um, And uh, but I'm really excited to jump into our topics today. Sweet. Well, I, I think, you know, with your background as having coached quite a few law firms of all different sizes, shapes, practice areas. Um, you know, just kind of to to uh, start out in terms of like things that you have seen that could really be improved upon, what has been some of the biggest mistakes that you have seen, you know, small firms and solo practitioners make um, as you have coached them? I, I think that's a, it's kind of a loaded question. It is. <laughs> yeah, there's it's a lot a loaded of different question. And I think there's a lot of different, <laughs> depending on the size, depending on the practice area. I think the one thing that I've recognized and seen across the board, um, across all firms is really reliance on doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. 
not really evaluating your business on a regular basis to see are there better ways to innovate our firm to provide better client experience for our prospects as well as our clients from end to end and just reliance on the old way of doing things right even though if you have kind of a in, you know, a, you know, younger millennial attorney coming right out of law school that maybe spends a little bit of time in a larger firm and then eventually makes the decision to start their own firm. They bring a lot of those habits to yeah. the table. And then what happens is, is they get stuck into running their business with those habits. So I, I think it's really not, not look, you know, being kind of stuck in the business, doing the legal work, being the only person does consultations, just really being the only person kind of running the day to day and not kind of stepping out and saying, how can we continue to improve? I think that's probably the biggest mistake that I've seen um, if we're going to really narrow it down to one thing. Yeah. And and I guess along that same front, in terms of coaching somebody that's in that position, what do you kind of offer, you know, and obviously this is not a one size fits all kind of response, but in terms of getting people to step outside of their business, what are some of the strategies that you give to clients in terms of scheduling time for that or, um, uh, you know, other, other strategies for how to step outside the business? Yeah, I think the, the first, the first strategy is mindset right? Getting past that mindset of, of I'm the only one that, that can do this thing. Um, that's probably the first and the, the hardest, probably the hardest thing to overcome. But once we can get past that idea that they have to do everything, um, then the next thing is really understanding delegation, right? Once you get to a place that you can delegate work to somebody other than you, it then frees up space to then start thinking about how do I use this extra four hours a week that were you know previously consumed by doing bookkeeping or or other administrative tasks. So I think mindset is first. Second is really understanding delegation. I use the term, which is not I can't take ownership of the term. It comes actually from the book Traction, which is you have to delegate to elevate. And once you start delegating, you can elevate, and then that's where you can start elevating your thinking and creating space for strategic thinking for your firm. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's huge. I mean, I feel like that is such a difficult thing that that I don't know if it's really specific to attorneys, but I feel like we may have a uh, uh, but we we may have a a good uh, a good unhealthy ego in terms of in terms of what we're we're uniquely I, capable of. I don't know if it's ego to be honest. I, I think there's a little bit of ego. I actually think whenever it's a solo attorney that's relatively new new to running a firm, the biggest fear that I hear is it's my license, right? Yes. So yeah, their yeah. license, yeah. their license in their state. And when a mistake is made throughout, you know, law school throughout, you know, anything you hear from the bar, there's this um, unhealthy fear of disbarment, of ethics violations, right, which isn't unhealthy, because you want to set a good tone and have good ethics and follow bar regulations and things like that. But uh, I think when you start to really, uh, you know, in introduce that fear into your business, where you're afraid to do something as simple as delegating a portion of your file to a paralegal or a legal assistant to get some of the work done because you're afraid of your license, then I be, I think it becomes unhealthy. So that is really, from my experience, is the number one reason why people are mm. afraid to delegate is just the fear. It's my license, Jesse. That's why I hear all the time. It's my license. So like, how do I let go? Because if something happens and I get a bad review on Google, it's my license. So I keep hearing that over and over. Yeah. Again. So it, it's getting past you know, understanding what work I can do versus the oversight of that work. And there is a very different line of demarcation between the work that needs to be done and the oversight of that work. And, and in terms of, you know, delegation, what, you know, again, this is not a one size fits all question. I know you work with, again, law firms of, of all different sizes, but in terms of kind of solo um, uh, attorneys that you, you work with, is that something that, you know, at this point you're kind of, you know, looking at a whole 
you know, number of different options in terms of how to delegate, you know, instead of it just being, you need to, you know, hire somebody to come in and take over, you know, take over the work, you know, what type of virtual assistance may be available, what, um, you know, technologies might be available in order to kind of free up some of that time. What, what does that, you know, kind of conversation look like? Yeah, I, I think that's a, you, you know, you brought up one, which is the virtual kind of virtual assistant. A lot of solos, when they first get started, they're, you know, they're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And the first thing that I think is important is to really like sit down and take time to really evaluate how you're spending your time. The fastest way I, I used to be terrible with my time management years ago. And the tool that actually really helped me get a kind of an understanding of where I was spending my time was an AI time tracking tool. And that AI time tracking tool gives you a visibility of everything you're working on and also the time you're wasting, like right. how much time you spent on Twitter looking at Elon Musk's post about you know, <laughs> or, or politics, right? Um, so getting an understanding of where you're spending your time is the first step and, and then evaluating what do I have to do individually as the attorney in the firm? What can I immediately know and identify that I can delegate? And then where is the gray area? And then the question is, is are you holding on to the gray area because you're afraid of letting it go or are you afraid of perfection, right? There's this also the mindset of I can do it better. So why would I give it to someone else? So there's that attorney work, the non-attorney work that is administrative and then the gray area that I think um, once you understand what you can delegate, then it's a matter of saying, well, who can do that best? Well, accounting, all right, hire a bookkeeper, right? Have somebody in, do your bookkeeping. Um, doing marketing, maybe hire a marketing assistant. Maybe there's a lot of administrative work such as sending out invoices, billing, collections, things like that. Let that go. Then maybe an intake specialist. You let that go. You don't have to hire full-time people. There's lots of resources in today's market that allow you to de delegate things to contractors, fractional people, uh, virtual assistants in the Philippines and Venezuela, Argentina, and all over the world. Um, so, but you really have to know what you can and will delegate first. And, and I recommend an AI tool because it's the best way to see what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that being able to see, you know, where you, where you spend your time, I mean, it's, it's probably almost sickening how many hours are spent, you know, checking email. It's probably like a, just an absurd amount of time that is spent, uh, you know, look at, looking at emails, um, you know, reviewing things that you've looked at for the third or fourth time in the day that haven't changed, you know, your calendar, whatever it might be. And so, um, yeah, I have, having some sort of a tracking tool is a great, great thought on that in terms of really evaluating where that time is going on that kind of like AI front, you know, I know that this is definitely a place of, of interest, on your end of things and that your uh, company scale legal really is concentrating in this area in terms of helping attorneys understand the AI that exists out there. So talk a little bit about how you see um, AI kind of changing the face of law, particularly when it comes to um, solo practitioners and small, small law firms. Yeah, I, I mean it's a it's a topic I love talking about and, and routinely are, are you know working with the people that I'm coaching as well as those that I'm not coaching to really look at ways to improve the efficiency and productivity of their firm. And I think that's the number one place that AI has the most potential um, in any any business, but more specifically inside of law firms. The the thing that I think a lot of people get hung up on is AI isn't just ChatGPT, right? Everybody. Right kind of get stuck into this chat GPT thing. And then the other re reality that a lot of people, or not a reality, but they have this opinion about AI is that, well, it's not prime time. And that's true. It's not prime time. Chat GPT came out in November of 2022. So yeah. we're just a little over a year. Now, open AI has been around for years before that, but chat GPT as a, as a consumer-based tool has only been around for a little over a year. So I think we're still very early in the process. A lot of people signed up and now a lot of people stopped using it. So we saw a drop off pretty quickly <laughs> initially when OpenAI launched it. But I think where it really could change law firms in the next five to 10 years is really around uh, research, right? And yes, we are still seeing some issues around the validity of the data 
But we're able to now personally teach AI with documents and information. So there's no reason why we can't take a, a, a document from a law library on a specific case or matter and have it ingest a 500 word or a thousand, you know, or a thousand page document, consume that information and help us synthesize the data. And I recently heard a podcast from a Harvard uh, business uh, school professor where he actually encourages his students to use ChatGPT to create their output because he said, this tool's not going away. But he said, I also tell them it is your responsibility to ensure the validity of the information that it's providing in the output. So yeah, I think awesome. in the legal space, we can look at research, we can look at client relationships, for example, intake, you and I were just talking about using an AI chatbot for intake, um, learning and development for your teams, customization of the client journey, um, creating content for marketing, that right now is the best place to use AI is in marketing and sales. Uh, creating objection handling of, uh, you know, if a client calls you, and you continuously, your conversion rate is low and you're trying to better understand ways to improve objections that your clients have for your services, you could create an objection handling document based on the data that you have. Um, other things like just having it brainstorm ideas with you. It's like a, almost like a business coach in a way that you can actually sit there and spend time getting ideas from it. But I think in the legal space right now in the next probably 12 to 24 months, marketing and sales is the best use case. And then probably three to five years from now, it's going to be more around risk management. It's going to even be able to do things like help you assess particular, particular outcomes of different criminal cases in your particular field, but also in non-criminal cases, it can help you with strategy, look at the risk associated to your strategy based on actual data from law libraries. So I think as it evolves, as it matures in technology, there's going to be so many use cases. And I don't know, um, Jacob, you've ever heard this term, but like the first three person billion dollar company actually started sometime in, in the past like five years. Um, we don't know who that is, but there is a th three person billion dollar company that is going to be, we're going to see that in probably the next five to 10 years. I mean, yeah, they already so started. Crazy. It was a startup company that they, they're still probably one or two people, and they're just going to be able to use AI, bots, automation to really streamline their businesses. And I think we're going to see that in the legal industry, but we're seeing resistance, Yeah, right? We're going to see resistance <laughs> because there's a lot of skepticism in the legal industry. So I think it's going to take a little bit longer than probably normal industries, but marketing and sales is a great use case right yeah, I mean, I think that on the research front, I mean, you know, you you know that Le Lexus and uh, Westlaw are, you know, spending, you know, probably hundreds of millions of dollars trying to like figure figure out how to use AI and incorporate that into their software. Because if you think about the amount of time that uh, big law firms are spending in terms of associates' time doing basically what AI can can do. Um, it's, I mean, you know, going to have billion dollar impact in, in our industry. And so as that then, you know, technology wise funnels down to smaller firms, that's going to be available at a much kind of more reasonable cost for, for everybody. And so again, doesn't mean you go write your brief at this point using chat GPT, but there is, you know, a lot of, a lot of reason to start kind of thinking about how to do the research that way. And that's why I like what, what you mentioned with that Harvard business professor. You know, I think that a lot of a lot of schools are trying to like figure out, you know, how do we test students that can, you know, use chat GPT to write papers. And it's kind of like, you know, at some point you 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 kind of expect that people are going to use the technology just like you know you wouldn't punish somebody for using, using you know Google. Google or or even Microsoft Word as a spell check yeah. right like there's technology that gets built into things you know grammar checks and all kinds of things that are currently you know be, being used and that's just because the technology is out there but I agree on the marketing and sales and the the intaker software that you kind of um put out there to us to to research is is pretty wild as are a lot of chatbots that are available and you know we were talking about this um 
on our leadership team meeting about kind of uh, you know how to kind of onboard um, you know using using a chat bot on the on the website and what that process would look like what the questions are and you know one of the one of the attorneys just brought up you know well I I don't really like using uh, a chat bot and I think that you know part of that is true it's like you know we've all been in that place where it's like oh my gosh I'm talking to a robot but there's kind of like two thoughts that go through you know my mind is that you know there's there's more and more user friendliness to using the chatbot to where it's actually faster and um uh getting you answers quicker than if you're waiting on a phone call for a live person for you know 45 minutes or whatever it might be depending on the industry but the other the other thing was that the uh you know just out of necessity, people are getting more used to using chatbots because there's so many companies now that that is really the only way to interact with them is through yeah. a chatbot first. And maybe at some point the the conversation is taken over by a live, you know, a rep somewhere. But um, you know, the people's I think resistance to using a chatbot in particular is going down as so many industries, you know, I've, I've now had to do this recently several times with the DMV, um, with, with a bank. I can't remember what the other business was, but it was like, this is the only way to like, kind of start the Business. conversation. And again, you know, there, there is a pretty, the, the technology has vastly improved over the last five years where five years ago, it's like, you know, you're not, you're not even, you know, in the ballpark of the issue that I'm trying to get, get to. And now it's like, man, you're getting me the specific answer that I was looking for helping me to create an appointment or whatever it might be. It's like, we're getting down to the, to the actual end, end result in, you know, seconds, as opposed to, again, like a 45 minute call that would have taken beforehand. We, you talked about the DMV, right? Yeah. I just recently renewed my registration and, and it's a, it's a newer car. So I didn't have to get an inspection. Yeah. And I literally went on to this website. It's a chat bot and it said, put your, you know, your VIN number in boom, put your little code from your paper. Boom. You want to pay now? Boom. Done. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have to, I didn't have to go to the DMV and stand in a line for six yeah. and a half hours. Right. You did bring up something that I was, I think is important that I want to just kind of double click on a little bit. There is a technology out there. So we think chat chatbots are are cool, but there's a technology out there and the company specifically, there's a, there's a few companies. One is air.ai. And air.ai is a conversational AI. And it literally can um can do callbacks and it will have a full-on conversation over the phone with you. And you won't even know that it's an AI person talking to you. And they're getting closer and closer to sound exactly like it. There's some things like laughs. They don't do very good at laughing <laughs> and things like that. It sounds like ha, 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 right? <laughs> um, but in general, I think you're going to even see like an intake process where let's say somebody completes a for starts to complete a form and then abandons the form. Uh, we're seeing it mostly in things like abandoning carts on, on e-commerce purchases. This AI will call you back and say, Hey, you know, hey Jake, I noticed you were trying to buy this thing on Apple.com. Uh, when when you know, you know, kind of just better understand why you decided not to buy this. And it will actually try to sell you on that thing. So uh, I think we're gonna see a lot of AI technology that does replace people. Um, but I think we really need to look at how do we up-level the people that we do have when we introduce technology. We don't have to abandon everybody simply due to AI, but the AI are going to be tools that really enhance our businesses. And I think at some point in the future, they'll enhance our Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's to me, we talked a good bit about this at the, the summit. Cole Meta had done a, a pretty lengthy um, presentation on um, AI and some different different uses of, of AI in the legal industry. And one of the things that he emphasized is, you know, maybe this does uh, replace again, kind of certain work items, but it doesn't replace people, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's almost like that delegate and elevate that you were just talking about. We're delegating, you know, lower level tasks to AI so that, you know, whether it's us or other people on our team can bring, you know, more to the client experience, like really yes. be able to like thrive in that, you know, being able to deliver 
um, you know, the experience side of things, put our time where it is kind of most valuable. And so to me, that's really where the gap will be between law firms that adopt AI quickly and law firms that don't, because if you've got a, you know, a chat bot, like the one that, that was, you know, shown to us through Intaker is pretty wild in terms of, you know, the, the way that it starts a conversation through basically almost like a video, a, a video explanation tries to get you to kind of uh, interact with the, with the chat bot. But then once you get in, I mean, it's asking, very rapid questions that are important to the case. You know, um, did uh, what, what type of matter are you calling about? You know, all different types of criminal and traffic charges. Say it's a DWI. Um, you know, did this involve an accident? Was your uh, uh, breath alcohol concentration 0.08 or greater? You know, all of this kind of back and forth of intake and it's fast. Um, all of that is then, you know, collected the the client can be immediately contacted by um you know a, a text message and an email follow up to say hey somebody is reviewing your information we'll be in touch shortly so it's just this kind of immediate contact but then what that allows the people that were doing intake to do is to really then call that client and basically kind of hit the ground running as opposed to you know it, it's it's a uh, it's not you know really something that you can necessarily connect around getting somebody's phone number and email address correct right like i mean that's just you know that's just input but when somebody is now able to call back and say you know hey john appreciate you reaching out to us you know i see that you got this um dwi on this date um you know here's what our process is is going to look like from this point i mean again now you can really focus on the human side of things. So I think right. that, that that gap of client experience is really going to widen for um, you know, firms, whether they're solo or small, that are using that AI versus versus everybody that's still kind of doing all of the data entry because you just only have so many hours in the day. And if that's where your time is going, you can't put it into um, you know, improving other elements of the client journey. Yeah. Yeah, I think you described a great intake process, right? And that that, that intake process is important because I, I don't remember where the data was. So I, the number that I saw was that for prospective clients, if you can communicate with them within 15 seconds of them arriving on your website and get in front of them, the likelihood of you closing that client to become a paid you know, client of your business, whether it's a law firm or a non-law firm, you'll have a high, significantly higher chance. And that time delay, the likelihood of you closing goes further and further and further as time goes by. And if you wait 24 hours and you're not communicating with your prospect, you're likely not going to close them. And I think, unfortunately, one of the biggest mistakes that I see in the legal industry is a lot of law firms, you know, they don't have a good intake process. They don't have a way to get back to their clients quickly. So I think if you're struggling to get new clients in the front door, fix that process and you'll probably see the number of clients you have double because you're going to have an opportunity to get in front of more people. So I think that is spot on an intake. Intaker is a great chatbot, but that is just one piece of the entire intake process yeah. and creates personalization and your team still plays a role in that process. Yeah. I think that's one thing that we, you know, uh, at, at our firm have really, you know, struggled with in terms of, you know, the, uh, intake process is, is really kind of thinking about how do we, you know, interact with, with clients all the, all the time. Um, and you know, it used to be that, you know, Hey, your, your website is like your 24 hour billboard, right? Like, you, you know, it's your 24 hour salesperson, but, you know, just looking at the, at the website in this day and age, you know, and that kind of like brochure model is not enough. There's got to be something in terms of, you know, outreach or availability during those odd hours to get the conversation going because you don't know when somebody's visited your website, but you sure do know if they have, you know, obviously given you a phone call, which is what we're all hoping for, but the likelihood of it going to, phone versus message is declining on the phone end, you know, day by day and increasing on the message end. And I think that, you know, we, we as a legal industry and I, I'll, I'll just, you know, full, full acceptance of responsibility at our firm, you know, I, I think there's been way too heavy a reliance that people 
want to call first and, you know, want to, want to talk to you. And that is something I know that when we, uh, when we shared coffee a few weeks back, you you were just kind of, you know, shaking your head at, you know, they, you know, clients don't want to talk to you. And I, I, I love that thought process. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to talk to you. I mean, just, and, and the generational gaps, you know, the, the, baby boomer generation, they're no longer utilizing our services as much as they did maybe 10 years ago, right? And their children are utilizing services for them, right? Elder law and things like that, and uh, estate planning and and trust administration, but it's typically they're not the ones consuming your services. It's it's the younger generation. And as we go younger and younger in who we're serving in our law firms, ultimately what we're going to see is a shift in communication. I mean, I have to text message my kids to tell them that it's dinner time, right? Like, and it's not even text message. It's, you know, Snapchat or WhatsApp, right? It's not even text message. Text message is even arcane for the younger generation. Yeah. So I think we have to constantly be looking at how do people want to be served and not assuming that the way we do it now is the right way. It's really asking your clients. And part of that is having, you know, doing surveys and reaching out to your clients and better understanding what their needs are and asking the question, what is your preferred method of communication? And if they're, if nobody's saying email and no, nobody's saying text message, then we need to find a way to communicate them in a way that is more meaningful to them. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, uh, having, having some, some, uh, sounding board, um, is is great. I mean, especially if you're reaching out to clients, e- even if you're talking to other members of your of your team or family, uh, you know, so- somebody that is kind of in that in the space of you know maybe ideal client age range or or at least yeah. you know some age range of the client that you serve. We were doing a weekly huddle yesterday at the office and talking about um, basically you know kind of uh, going into 2024. We are owed nothing as a firm. We've got to we got to earn everything. Um, you know, there's there's no expectation based on past successes or how long we've been around or anything along those lines that we're owed anything. And I was going through some failed businesses, um, you know, uh, from from the past. So I mentioned Blockbuster, Radio Shack, Toys R Us, Borders Books, and for I think three or four of the. Uh, people on the call, they had no idea who Radio Shack and Borders were, you know, it was just like that, you know, so that, that almost proved the point. It's like, you know, they're, they're so, these were not only like giants that failed, but they're giants that nobody even remembers at this right. point. And so I think, you know, just having that connection point of, um, you know, being able to just kind of realize, Hey, this is not, this is not something that everybody, you know, assumes is going to operate the same way when it comes to, contacting or reaching out to businesses and just from personal experience again the uh the ability to get things done you know online without having to go through a phone call making a reservation for dinner um you know uh get getting you know getting an answer to something obvious three obviously through um google you know getting a, setting up a appointment with a dentist or doctor via you know an online portal whatever it might be i mean it just is is clearly changing it yet we are still like just so you know kind of focused on the phone to phone um conversation and it's just you know that's something that we really need to be aware of and and i i I, you know i say this again just because we're, we're in this position at our firm of being kind of slow to make that you know transitioned into a more message friendly first but i think that generally speaking on the criminal defense bar and we are some of the slowest adopters of technology um, simply because we're, we're not, you know, really overly focused on kind of the business of, of law. I mean, I would say we're under focused on the business of law in terms of our, our kind of uh, practice area, particularly. So I think, you know, in order to better serve our clients, that's one of those things that we really need to make the the push forward on because it's it's something where we can really add a ton of value to our clients end if we can cut down our own time through some of these technologies. Yeah, I, I think a lot of law firm owners need to be open to bring in different fresh perspectives. And it's not just, you know, consultants or advisors that can do that. Uh, it could be your own team, right? Your team, you know, as you bring in a paralegal, 
you can have conversations with them about, you know, how, how do you prefer to communicate? What is your preference in, in how a law firm would interact with you? And to your point, like you have family members too. So I think that you have to get an outside perspective. You, you have to really have somebody come in and really say, hey, here's what's possible. Now let's figure out how do we incrementally add that value into your customer journey and add value to the firm that we're not increasing the amount of work for the business. But at the same time, we're, we're changing the way that our clients interact with us every single day. And I don't think in the legal industry, there's enough emphasis around the end to end client journey. I think we focus on, you know, finding the people, getting them a call in, getting them to schedule the consult, signing the engagement letter, getting the legal work done and going on to the next person, uh, rather than looking at it as, as an entire loop and, and the interaction that we can keep basically interacting with those same people in a way that's meaningful to them so that they feel valued, that they're willing to say, you've got to call Jake. You know, if you yeah. have these problems, call Jake. And that's the only person in their mind that they could ever imagine referring out if they hear somebody, whether it's at church or at, you know, at the water cooler, as they say, that's probably an old term that's arcane dinosaur word, but, um, you know, being able to just say, this is who I recommend. And the only way you're ever going to get that type of brand for your law firm is to create an amazing client experience. Yeah, to totally agree. And I, I think that, you know, uh, in, in terms of kind of getting to that, to that level, I think that, you know, incorporating amazing systems into your business, where again, I think that the value of systems is just the time saving mechanism of them where you then can put your time into actual client relationship. I think that that's why, you know, so many lawyers get burned out because we're doing the legal work. And when we, you know, went into law school, what, you know, you know, most people didn't imagine just sitting behind a desk, you know, writing or, um, you know, typing out email messages. Like that's not what they thought of when they thought of practicing law. Like it was standing in a courtroom in front of, you know, in front of a jury or, um, you know, standing beside their, beside their client in their kind of time of need, having a meaningful conversation in a, you know, consultation, um, you know, over, over a desk. I mean, you know, s something where there's like true human interaction is what drew most of us into this work, but then we just get bogged down with all of the busy work, the, the, the you know, the daily, grind of things that, that, you know, do have to get done, but a lot of times it's just that poor process. And I think, you know, at, fr from the, uh, in the early stages of our firm, when we kind of started to, started to systemize, systematize things, I think personally, I almost kind of undervalued people because basically it was kind of like, if we have the perfect system, it won't matter who the person is that's running the system. It won't make any difference. You know, we can, you know, we can uh, have, you know, somebody with zero experience and zero personality deliver if we, if we have the right system in place. And again, when you, when you're, you're just talking about, you know, you want that, um, that client to be like, Jake is the only person that uh, that this person would call, or um, John or Sarah, whoever it might be, is the only person that this client would call. I think that you know it's really the meeting of systems and the right people because you know most of the most of the time, um, you know it's it's what we kind of tend to get you know under focused on one area or the other or both. But, um, you know, you can't, you can't be that go-to person if you don't have the right systems, cause you're never going to have enough time for your client. And you also can't be that go-to person if you're, you know, not delivering the client experience well, no matter how good your, you know, your systems are. Um, but that just kind of made me think, think back to that, what you just said about, you know, being that, being that go-to, it's really that combination of both of those things. Yeah. Usually in coaching, you know, going back to your, you know, your first question that you asked about coaching. I usually ask a few questions at the big beginning of a coaching engagement. And I always ask the question, how does your firm look differently in 12 months than it does today in your mind, right? The, the vision that you have for your firm. And there's usually two areas that they want to make the biggest changes. The first one is always systems, almost mm, like universally people want to make changes, add systems because they realize 
that they're spending a lot of time. They have a lot of inefficiencies in their business. They're not as profitable as they want to. They don't have enough leads coming into the business. And the second is, is they want either a better team than they have, or they want a team that can perform and really make a difference in their firm. firm. And, you know, I, I always kind of use the good to great Jim Collins book of you got to have the right people in the right seat on your bus. And so many people have the wrong people in the wrong seat. One person sitting in six seats on the bus. Right? <laughs> that is really common in the legal space. Yeah, it is. Probably in all spaces, but specifically in the legal industry, I see a lot of people trying to like use one person for six different jobs. Um, and I think that once once somebody recognizes that the intersection, and I, I think I talked about this at the Freedom Fighters Summit, there's an intersection between uh, customer experience and employee experience. Mm -hmm. Customer experience yes. is driven by great employee experience and having the right people in the right seats. And then customer experience, client experience is driven by those people, but having the systems to ensure that the client experience continues and is streamlined in operation. So I think if you focus on those two and understand the intersection between the two and the value that that brings your client through the journey, you're going to build a firm that's going to scale. You're going to make the money that you want to make. You're going to have a higher, higher profitability and you're going to keep your team longer um, because if your team are not feeling overworked and undervalued, they're going to, you know, they're going to continue to stay for a very long time if they feel valued and they feel that, Hey, I'm not burnt out. So I think building those two and understanding the two that they really play with each each other is so important for any business that grows, but more specifically for any business in the legal space. And I guess along along the uh, lines of these these two kind of big issues of you know we need you know in the next twelve months I'd like to have better systems or better people. Um, whether it's as to, to kind of one of those two big, big hitter issues or anything else, is there any recurring, um, like low hanging fruit that you typically see when it comes to coaching, um, specifically like a new, a new client that has reached out to you, um, you know, looking to improve their law firm. Is there, is there any kind of areas of concentration? Obviously you mentioned delegation, um, earlier, but, but anything else that kind of is, is common low hanging fruit on that front. Yeah, I, I I don't take a cookie cutter approach for sure because every firm is very different. Every attorney is very different. Every business is different. But I, I think in general, it starts out truly understanding what are their biggest issues, right? right. And I, I have a background in the entrepreneurial operating system, US traction. So really understanding what your core issues are in your business and, and how they're impacting your employees, how they're impacting your clients, how they're impacting profitability. The first step is truly understanding what your biggest issues are and then prioritizing those issues so that you can then start working down from the biggest issues. The biggest issues might take a long time, but if you don't fix those big issues, none of the smaller issues are really going to ever get fixed, right? Like I always say to, to people when they're looking to, you know, I need more leads, you know, for my, for my business to grow. And I say, well, before we look at your leads, let's look at your pipeline. Let's understand, are you converting at a higher rate? Because if we improve your conversion rate by a smaller period of time, you know, a smaller percentage, you, you don't might not have to bring more leads in. You yeah. want to eventually bring more leads into your business, but let's really look at, you know, how is your conversion rate? What does your intake process look like? Let's build and fix that first, because that's probably likely your root cause of why you're not converting enough clients into engagement letters. Then we can look at putting more money into SEO, into PPC and other marketing strategies. And I look at systems the same way. Like you don't need to build an HR playbook if you don't have any employees. Let's focus on other aspects of your business that are most impacted today, like finances. Are you profitable? Let's, if you're not profitable, let's understand why you're not profitable. Let's really, is it, is, are you overspending? You know, are, are you not priced high enough, right? A lot of times just simply making a small incremental change in your pricing will ultimately help you get to profitability faster than trying to cut expenses, right? Everybody always yeah. wants to cut, 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 but you don't have to always cut, right? So I think it, you have to take it one step at a time. But the one thing that I, I look at everybody is what are your biggest issues? And let's work into those issues, understand the root cause, 
then start looking at solutions. In, in the US methodology, they call that IDS, right? We need to identify first before we get to solving that problem and then making a decision of who does it, how we do it, when we do it. Um, but you always have to start with the issues first in your business and you don't have clarity of your issues. Let's start there first. I'm, I'm just curious in terms of people that that call you, what would you say is like the percentage of people that call you just like help and, you know, asking for just the, Hey, I need, I need to, I need to change versus people that say, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to work on this particular thing. Do you have a sense of like how many, how many people are, are kind of more it just that like, you know, something's not working um, versus I want help on this particular problem. I think there's just from my experience in coaching, there's typically a couple buckets. You have the people that they've have, they've built their business, they've hit a certain threshold revenue-wise, let's say, uh, you know, solo, probably in the 350 range, 350K by themselves, depending on obviously your practice area. If you're like you're a securities attorney, you're making a lot more than 350, right? Because of just the nature of that practice. But family law, criminal, PI, immigration that area of practice, there's a threshold financially. So it's usually I've hit this ceiling revenue wise and income wise, I can't figure out how to scale. There's that mindset of I've hit a threshold. I feel pretty good. I'm not overworked, but I, I want to grow. Then there are those people that feel their entire life is in chaos. Their marriage is on the rocks. Their life is on the rocks. They don't have time to hit the gym. Uh, they feel like they're working from the time before the sun comes up and well after the sun goes down. There's those people. And then there are those solos that are like, I don't even know where to begin. You know, I, I went to law school. I don't really know about business. And they kind of say, hey, I, I really need help getting this off the ground. And in the strategies of cross those three buckets are very different, right? The growth one is understanding how did you get to where you're at? Right. So then we can double down and figure out how to scale and move you forward. The ones that are in chaos, it's figuring out how to triage the wound that's, splurt, you know, splurting blood everywhere. Right. Like being like a doctor, it's like, let's patch the, the biggest hole first. Then we can figure that out, because until you can actually remove the chaos, it's really hard to streamline a chaotic business. And for the solos, it's like, let's get you more business. Like it's sales and marketing. Like you don't need to systematize your business. You don't need to operationalize your business. We just need to give you strategies to like bring in more people. So I, I think it, there's not a clear answer. It's the yes. attorney answer. It depends, right? But ultimately I think it, it's, th those are the three buckets that I often see the most. Yeah, I think, I mean, I just think that the, uh, th there's a lot of, a lot of criminal defense lawyers. And again, that's the the bar that I'm interacting with most. I mean, you know, I have, I have lawyer friends that are outside of that industry, but by and large, I mean, that's the vast majority of attorneys that I'm interacting with. And I think that so often for, for us in terms of the conversation that I have with my, you know, brothers and sisters in the criminal defense bar, it's just kind of like, you know, very limited, um, uh, kind of uh thought process in terms of of overall business mindset and i th and so i feel like it's kind of one of those things where in terms of when it comes to coaching or reaching out to somebody that is um you know uh kind of in in the world of business or or you know uh, going to a, a you know marketing conference or whatever it might be it's kind of like i don't even know what i would take away from this cuz i'm not really sure what my issues are. And I think, you know, that's, that's probably a good sign to reach out to somebody. I think that's maybe kind of part, part of my thought process in terms of asking that like attorney psychology question is I think that there's, there's a good, good, uh, uh, portion of the, of the population in practice that is just like, you know, I really don't know what I'm doing when it comes yeah. to business and how do I figure this out? And, you know, so for, for a lot of us that are running small firms, it's like, you know, all right, well, I'm going to just go try to read some business books or I'll look at what other people are doing in this yeah. space, or I will talk to another lawyer. And, you know, it is kind of wild, like, you know, for the first, for the first 10 years of practice, there was no thought in my mind at all 
about like, maybe I should get a business coach like that. You know, that wasn't even on the radar. It was like, you know, I just try to figure out the wild West on my own. And, you know, again, it, it wasn't like I was resistant to coaching. It was like, this isn't even an option. And so I think, you know, part of that was just, you know, you don't, you don't know sometimes what you don't know, but I think, you know, get, getting that direction can be incredibly yeah. helpful. Yeah. The, the people that I see that don't do some sort of coaching and coaching isn't, it doesn't have to be a permanent thing. It could be, I have a place in my life and in my business right now that I know that I need some outside support on. So it may be a two or three year range. I, I'll give you a, a good example without sharing specifics, but I, you know, I recently worked with a family law attorney out of Virginia and a year ago when she started coaching her, her revenue, she's an experienced attorney, but she had never ran her own business. Her, her revenue in year one was 180,000. And in 12 months, we took her from 180,000 to over a half a million. And her goal Crazy. this year is another million, right? So that was really around her one, doing the fit, doing the work, getting the work done but having a coach to really challenge her in her thought process, having a coach to give her advice around the specific area that she needed focus on. So uh, this particular person, she, she pretty much heeded all the advice that was given by, uh, you know, I, I coach with law firm mentor. I don't coach uh, individually scale legal as a different mission, but um, I still do coaching with law firm mentor and a lot of the law firm mentor clients that get in there, they, they have, they're in that exact position. Like I've hit a certain threshold. I don't know what to do next. And having a coach helps move them, you know, kind of over that next threshold. And even the ones that are in the million dollar range and above, there's a different level of challenges. Like, as you know, Jake, you've kind of hit certain milestones in your firm. And I'm sure if you go back and look at what challenges you had, your challenges changed. So it's it's having somebody coaching guide you through. There's lots of books out there, but the problem is, is all those books, a lot, a lot of it is based on ex lived experience by that person or their opinion or their perspective and trying to make a brand for themselves. Yes. Whereas, you know, at Law Firm Mentor, we take a very, un you know, unique approach. We bring in, we have multiple coaches with different expertise and we literally almost think of it like a community approach where we look at your business holistically and help you move to the next direction. So no matter if you're choosing, you know, an organization like Law for Mentor or any coaching organization, really look at it from the perspective is how is this going to challenge me? And what do I want to accomplish in five years? Don't just look at the one year mark. How is this going to change my business and my personal life five years from now? And if you're not looking that far down the road, in my opinion, you're, you're too short sighted. Yeah, totally agree. I, th I think, you know, that individual feedback that you're getting from another human being that is individually assessing your situation with experience is critical. And then the accountability component of having a coach is just so amazing because it's like, you know, you, you, you know, you can go out there and set all of these goals and, you know, unless you're telling somebody else about those and then basically regularly meeting to kind of see like, Hey, did you meet these you know, metrics, things that you're going to, you, you said you were going to do. I mean, really not having that accountability structure is massively problematic if you don't have anybody else holding your feet to the fire, you know, even, even in just like a true question way of like, Hey, you know, these are the things that we said we are going to try to get done, you know, since our last meeting. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, not, not much, uh, not much happened. And there's only, only I hear some... that all the time. <laughs> it's like, then the question that a coach should ask is, all right, you, you said you were going to get this done in the last two weeks and you didn't let's better understand what got in the way. Yeah. You know, is it, is it a mindset issue, which, you know, you don't ask them straight up is, is a mindset issue, right? But you can kind of dig into whether or yeah. not, well, I really don't want to make those phone calls. Well, why? Yeah. Like, let's talk about why. Well, yeah. I, I don't know how they're going to see me. Okay. So you're worried about the way others are going to perceive you. Yeah. So let's talk deeper about that. Or is it, I didn't make any time for it. So then that's a time management issue or a prioritization issue. And uh, so I, I think you're spot on, right? A lot of times people come to coaching calls and they're like, I didn't do what I said I was going to do. So yeah. it is a form of accountability as well. Yeah. Well, I, you had, uh, you had mentioned, um, you know, in terms of 
kind of getting into the profitability space, one of the easiest ways to do that is to increase fees as opposed to necessarily mm -hmm. cutting cost. And one thing that I think, you know, across the board, attorneys struggle with, and you know, I think part, for me, part of, part of this, you know, at the at the firm is how do I kind of couch to other lawyers when we're increasing fees? You know, how do I get everybody on the team kind of behind that? Because there's a lot of resistance in terms of, you know, uh, you know, am I worth that much? You know, how you know what are clients going to think about this? You know, uh, clients aren't going to be able to afford our services anymore. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of resistance, generally speaking, to raising fees. So when you're coaching clients on um, that that are you know you see as undercharging for their for their services, what does that kind of coaching look like? Yeah, I I think you brought up a lot of it, right? Is just like this, I'm not worth it. That's the first thing. A lot of attorneys they don't feel that they are worth that. So it's really understanding why they don't see themselves as a $500 or an $800 an hour attorney. Obviously, a lot of people are, are flat fee, right, or contingency based, whatever that is. It ultimately comes down, our time is worth a certain incremental amount of money, yeah. right? That's ultimately what our time is worth. So the first thing is really understanding worth. Uh, the second thing is, uh, the one question is, my market won't bear that, right? Like the market, Asheville, you know, I use the Asheville as the example. Asheville won't bear that kind of price. And that's not always true, right? So there are a lot of firms that are a quantity-based firm that is purely about volume, bringing in as many cases as they can and doing them for the cheapest amount of money possible. If you have a system that streamlines that and you're really good at doing that, that's great. But then the question is, is there a saturation point in your market, right? That's the, the big question. Depending on, you know, criminal, there's always going to be people committing crimes, unfortunately, that's the world we live in. But, you know, there are certain markets where there's only a finite amount of small businesses in your market. So if right. you're a small business attorney, you're going to hit a saturation point. So it's really, we talk a lot about mindset. And once we can get past the mindset part, it's really about truly understanding the, the value you deliver to market, understanding your client journey again, you know, how do we deliver value throughout that experience? And it really comes down to there's a lot of thousand dollar an hour attorneys out there, but they have fewer clients and they provide really strong, valuable service to those clients. So you don't have to serve 3000 clients. You can have a couple hundred clients to run the same type of firm. So I think that's one. And then there's a, a process we actually go about through in our coaching practice at Law for Mentor, which is the SKU process, SKU process, where we actually have them map every matter, every case type from start to finish of all the tasks that that, that is worked on for that, that particular file, who does the work? So we could say, okay, it's a legal assistant, it's a paralegal, it's the attorney, you know, whatever that law clerk might do some of the work. And then what is their rate and how much do we charge for that matter? So you, one, you can see whether or not you're profitable. That is the fastest way to show people that they're undercharging. Yes, I think that's awesome. That's the fastest way. Like, <laughs> let's take the emotions off the table yeah. for a moment and focus on quantitative data, right? Like your qualitative ideas behind it and your assumptions behind it are important, but let's look at the data. Then we can determine whether or not you have a 0% profit margin or a 50% profit margin. So once we do that, then it's a lot easier for them to go, oh my goodness, I am grossly undercharging mine you know, myself. Um, and then it's competitive analysis, right? Understanding what well, your competition is still important. But, you know, if your competition is charging you 3000 for a case type, you don't have to charge 3000. Your, your competition might provide terrible service to your client. So let's look at what value are they delivering and then look at what value you can deliver and how you deliver it differently. And I think that there's a lot of pieces in that. Mindset is important, but really looking at the quantitative data is so important to truly getting that point across very quickly. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I love I love the uh the mapping process. I think, you know, for for most lawyers that I've talked to, kind of the number one kind of base mark for how fees are set is just looking at what other law firms are doing. And I think there is you know, value in that. I think that's an important part of the equation in terms of, you know, eval evaluating whether ethically your fee is reasonable, but also just in terms of being competitive in your market. 
But really, I think that's where a lot of people stop. And instead of it being, you know, like, well, how can I then provide more value to the client? Or where am I specifically, you know, spending time on a client's case and and really thinking about each each step in the process i think there's just a, a lot of times where it's almost all based on kind of external factors as opposed to kind of that you know how can we be unique in this in this space and that's really where again too you know in terms of thinking that you're charging too high of a fee, you know, if, if everybody is kind of trying to base things off of all the other attorneys in their market and the, you know, the, the there's, there's, you know, several that are just charging next to nothing and that's what the baseline is, then it's really hard to uh, kind of look at it and say, well, we're doing things in a different way, or we could be doing things in a, in a different and more valuable um, way. So I, I think kind of, you know, just again, important to look at what other people are charging, but at the same time, I think it's really should be primarily focused on the value that you're bringing to the client versus what the competition is um, charging. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There, I think it's a holistic process. If you go outside of the legal space and you go into any other, you know, technology, for example, they have entire teams that evaluate a, a variety of, of metrics before they raise prices. They don't just say, well, that's Bob, Bob's doing it that way. So I got to do what Bob's doing or Mary's doing it that way. I got to do what Mary's doing. They truly look at it as part of their business and how they're going to achieve their goals instead of always looking at it from an emotional. But a lot of people, they look at it from the emotional side. And there's a lot of money mindset issues. A lot of attorneys come from the, a place of serving, right? They, they, they want to serve. They want to provide they want to help people, whether a criminal defense attorney wants to help people, whether it's an immigration attorney wanting to help people, you know, get status in the United States. A lot of them are trying to help people. So oftentimes the emotion comes from, well, if I charge too much, like I'm taking advantage of these people. Um, so there, there's a lot of things that people have to work to, uh, to, to getting past that and um, but still maintaining their ethical you know, responsibility, I think is important too. And, and their, you know, just their moral character. Right. Yes. Also as well. Yeah. I think, I think honestly, the, <clears throat> in terms of communicating this to other team members, I honestly think that it's really more the moral, uh, kind of, uh, choke point versus the ethical choke point that is generally like more of the resistance piece for for a lot of the team members is just like you know they really do care about you know the people that they are working with and you know want to make sure that we're not um you know basically that we're that we're not in a position where we're unable to help somebody that they would want to provide help to and so i might you know that's a that's a good thing you know to be kind of coming from that perspective um, yeah. so I, I think it's, I think it's important to recognize that, well, you know, kind of as we, as we come to a, a close Jesse, in terms of offering advice to, you know, a young, uh, lawyer out there that is, that is running their, their practice, um, what, what advice would you have for that, for that lawyer in terms of improving their practice over that, you know, five year, five year point, 12 month point, what, what, what advice would you have? I, I recently, I, I'm going to use the advice from an attorney that I recently had a coaching session with. Oh, sweet. I think, I think I can give you my opinion all day long, but this particular attorney was, you know, uh, not a younger attorney, but a, a newer business owner, right? And this person said, I never planned in my firm before. I just kind mm -hmm. of like ad hoc ran my business and I never did any planning and um, they started implementing planning cycles throughout their business for the last year. They have annual planning. Then they did a state of the firm with their team, told their team what their vision was and the direction they wanted to go. And then quarterly, they do planning sessions to kind of figure out where, we, where can we improve? What can we do different? How do we change the way that we're seeing in the market? So I think if I were to give one thing, one piece of advice, it would be about implementing a planning cycle in your business mm. and taking the time to step away from the day-to-day -day and really look at where do you want your business to go 
measure the, you know, where you're at compared to your goals. So having goals is part of your plan and um, solving those problems. We're like looking at where do we have challenges over the last 90 days? Where were our challenges? The next 90 days, where were our challenges? So that you can constantly be making progress and becoming a pro proactive firm rather than purely reactive, because that is so common in, in newer firms. And um, so I've heard a lot of attorneys say planning is so important to our business. And without really having that vision, uh, it's really hard for us to move forward. And once we've implemented effective planning, it's really made a huge difference for our businesses. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's that's great advice. I think that's the only way to work on your business instead of in it is to have those regularly scheduled planning opportunities and and really think through what the purpose of your your business is and what your you know strategy for execution is. So that that's great. I think that's such a powerful piece. Well, it's been it's been fun talking yeah, with you, you, Jesse. I mean, the the conversations we've had here over the past few months have been a blast. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom with the audience. Well, thank you for you know allowing me to share, and and I agree. I've always enjoyed our conversations, and look you know look forward to more of those. Me too.